we are about to start yeah we are about to start in a few minutes yeah so just let a few more people to come in hopefully more and more people to join us in this afternoon so uh please wait for a few minutes while uh, you are encouraged yeah to uh, open or turn on your camera yeah and you can also uh, later interact with our speaker and okay let's wait uh, for a few minutes Bina Bangsa School is a premier international Christian school which has adopted the Singapore curriculum for all levels, from preschool, primary, secondary, up to junior college. Bina Bangsa School is also an authorized Cambridge International Examination Centre, which offers both IGCSE and A-levels. Established in 2001, Bina Bangsa School stays faithful to its vision of educating students who will be the leaders of the future, rooted in our culture and grounded in the Word of God. It is our mission to help students have a clear sense of self-worth by being disciplined, open-minded and courageous throughout their learning journey. Over the years, we have spread our wings to Indonesia's big cities, Jakarta, Malang, Bandung, Sumaran and Balikpapan, preparing Indonesia's younger generation to be an integral part in the global community and make notable contributions in the 21st century. Our goal is not only to guide each student to achieve academic success, but also to excel in the soft skills like leadership, creativity, good character and compassion. In Bina Bangsa, students are encouraged to embrace technology instead of being apprehensive of it. This has engaged, enhanced and extended their learning. We aim to imbue the students with scholastic and humanistic aspiration that they can carry with them into adulthood. This is encapsulated in our theme for BBS. Smart, character and leadership. We use the English language as the medium of instruction for all subjects, with the Chinese and Indonesian language as part of our bilingual programs. Our students are nurtured to adopt Western thoughts and technology without losing their Eastern culture and morale. Students are encouraged to choose to participate in activities like Chinese calligraphy, orchestra, sports, drama, music and dance. Our experienced and dedicated teachers give their best and provide a warm and nurturing environment for students. We are blessed by having a cordial relationship with our parents and stakeholders. Their support has served the school as a pillar of strength. I am Huang Jing. I am five years old. I like this school because I like different science activities. 我觉得这个学校很好玩，也很有很多好的老师和同学。我觉得呃，这个学校和跟别的学校不一样，因为这个学校老师们和同学们全部很爱心。我觉得培育学校是一个棒棒的学校，你知道为什么吗？ 
uh, this is the Hong Kong and mainland China application sharing session. We have three speakers for today. They are uh, alumni of uh, BBS Speak. Yeah, I would like to now introduce the first speaker, uh, Phoebe Ishak. She is an alumni of BBS Speak 2020, and she is currently studying her first year of university at Shanghai Chao Tong University, studying journalism and communication. Hello, Phoebe. Hi, sir. Okay. I would like now to introduce the second speaker, Marcia Emily Gunawan, is a BBS Speak 2020 alumni. She is now studying civil engineering in Peihang University. When she was in, in school, she participated in a lot of events like Habitat for Humanity, and she was a member of a student initiated program, Yellow Light. She was also the co-captain of the girls soccer team year 2018 to 2019. Hello, Marcia. Hi, everyone. Okay. Now I would like to introduce the third speaker, Alicia Sutigno, is part of Bina Bangsa School's class of 21 and is now HKU class of 25. During her time in BBS, she was able to become a part of the prefectorial board and perform in the annual orchestra. She was also one of the members of the Indonesian team for the World Adolescent Robot Contest in Chongqing, winning the third place for the automation program. In BBS, she took part in various community service activities, most notably Bags of Kindness and EduShare. Graduating with four A stars in chemistry, physics, mathematics, and computer science. And now, a full Belt and Road Scholarship recipient. Alicia is currently studying engineering in the University of Hong Kong. Hello, Alicia. Hi, everyone. Okay, thank you for uh, the speakers who are ready to uh, share their experience and also their uh, about their scholarship and application. Okay, now uh, during the session, uh, I'm encouraging you to all uh, turn on your camera, yeah? And for today's session, we are uh, disabling the chat box, yeah? Because this is uh, only a small group meeting. We want you to ask your question directly by turning on the camera and also turning on your microphone if you have any question. So the first session would be uh, Phoebe and Marcia presenting about uh, mainland China application. And then the second session, Alicia Sutigno presenting about Hong Kong application. And then after that, the third session would be question and answer session. Yeah, so if you have any question, please take a note uh, on your book or somewhere else. Yeah, and then uh, you will be giving you will be given the opportunity to ask your question on the third session. Okay, now I would like to uh, welcome Phoebe and Marcia to start the presentation. Can everybody see the screen? Yes, yes, we can see the, the screen. Okay, um, hi everybody. Today, me and Phoebe will be presenting about um, how to apply to mainland China um, universities. 
Um, my name is Marsha, and as we've been introduced before, I'm a BBS PIC alumni of Class 2020. Um, now I'm currently studying in Peihang University uh, in Beijing. Uh, I'm taking civil engineering, and I'm also a recipient of the CGS scholarship, and uh, it's a full scholarship. Um, hi everyone, my name is Phoebe Ishak. I am a BBS PIC alumni, class of 2020, and I'm currently studying at Shanghai Chaotong University, and I'm also under the CGS scholarship. So, uh, so this is the brief overview of what we will be discussing in today's presentation. Uh, first would be a brief overview of universities in mainland China. Second is the application process. Third is about the uh, CGS or CSE scholarship. And lastly is why go to China for uni? Uh, so first, okay. Um, so basically China is really, really big. So there's like a lot of universities and a lot of options that you can take there. But because of time constrictions, uh, I would only be talking about the five, I would only be talking about five universities that's relatively more well-known and in the higher ranks. So first is Tsinghua University. Tsinghua University is currently the first in mainland China, second in uh, a QS Asia University rankings and 15th in the world rankings. Um, actually, we, <laughs> actually, um, before me and my, uh, me and several alumni, we went to Tsinghua University and Peking University, which is currently the second university uh, during our Beijing trip. And one thing that I got from it was that it has like the campus there is so big and there's so many facilities that, um, that there's so many facilities that's um, available there. So if like, one reason, I feel one reason to go to China is also because like of how big the facilities and like how, um, because of how big the campus is and how big the facilities are, like you would also have like much more opportunities there to be able to um, experience new things. Yeah, okay, next. Yeah. Okay, um, next is Peking University, which I mentioned. It is also second in mainland China, uh, 18th in the Asian world rank Asian rankings and seventh in the world ranking. Yeah. <laughs> Wait, sorry, I think my Wi-Fi. Uh... Okay, uh, third is Putan University. It is located in Shanghai and it is currently the third in mainland China, sixth in the Asian world rankings and 31st in the world rankings. Um, then there is Shanghai Jiaotong University, which is where I'm currently studying at. It's the fourth in mainland China and 10th in the QS Asian University rankings and 47th in the world. Um, then there is Beihang University, which is currently 12th in mainland China, 114th in the Asian University rankings and, 300 and 383rd in the QS world rankings, um, but although like the rankings may not be that high for Beihang, it's actually a really, really good university to, if you're interested in engineering courses, especially in aerospace. Um, yeah, so basically the reason why it's very low on rankings is because uh, uh, your ranking is based on the amount of research you put out, uh, yeah, and Basically, Beihang University doesn't really like to put out their research, which is why they are lower in rankings compared to the other universities. 
So it's because um, they do research the government, so they keep it up, but they don't uh, put out their research publicly. So next I'll be talking about the application process, uh, how to apply and the application period and what things you should prepare and tips for you to know. First is, um, so for applying to Chinese universities, all you have to do is visit the university's websites and first find out the details about the course you wanna take because Sometimes it differs um, if you're taking art, for example, uh, usually they have, um, other, uh, they have other requirements like for you to put your portfolio and earnings. Then you should create an account. Um, in that account, you'll just uh, fill out the application form and then, uh, and then it's done, basically that's it. But then you have to do for every university you want to apply to. And when you're applying, you should be prepared to pay an application fee. Um, the application generally starts October to November and then it ends at May, June. But then there's some university that provides like, for example, like Tsinghua um, Tashi, they have early rounds. They have like several rounds, but then it does not apply to all the universities. So you have to check um, more details uh, on your own. Um, and also it varies uh, with your major too. This is very general. Uh, this is like uh, what you have to prepare. This is what you must have, but then sometimes they ask for more. So what you have to have is a passport. Um, a passport. Graduation certificate, a photo of yourself, uh, official transcript, personal statement, a uh, financial guarantor letter. Last time I didn't take TOEFL and IELTS, but then I asked my university if they accept my IGCSE scores, and they did. So I just language uh, Chinese courses. You should have prepare HSK. Uh, for the tips, you can check out. Uh, websites like China Admission and CUCAS. China Admission is a website that I find is very helpful for applying your uh, applying for applying. But CUCAS is more of a website where they uh, come. They have a lot of information about the university itself, like the tuition fee, uh, what the dorm looks like, uh, how does the city feel like that. Uh, so you can find out more about the university and CUCAS. And another tip is you, you should not wait until the last minute to apply or to uh, prepare your documents because um, Chinese university, they respond very, very slow. So if you have questions about your application, you should do it very early so that you can get the answers on time. Also double check the dates, uh, make sure that you apply before the deadline. And because there's, they, there will be a lot of uh, websites for where you're applying, uh, a tip that I personally uh, would like to know before I applied is to write down all your account name and passwords because um, I forgot all of them. Okay, um, next is the CGS or CSE scholarship. Um. Uh, what is CGS? CGS stands for Chinese Government Scholarship, and it is awarded by the government for international students in Chinese universities affiliated with CSC. Um, the, pro the application process usually starts from December to April. Um, so this is the CSC application process. First, you need to prepare the required documents. Second, you need to scan and apply and submit the documents through the CSE website, which is written down below there. Um, third is you need to wait for the university to apply. And steps four and five depends on the university you apply to. But uh, for example, like my university, Shanghai Chiao Tong, 
uh, CSC applicants needed to go through an interview and afterwards, and after the interview, then we would get our acceptance results. Whereas for Beihang University, they didn't ask for an interview and instead just accepted right, uh, sent the acceptance result right away. Um, this is the list of required documents. First, you need a graduation certificate, or if you haven't graduated yet, you can ask for um, a letter about your expected graduation and your proof of enrollment. Second is a clear scan of your passport. Third, you need your study report card. Fourth is a study or research plan in China. Fifth is you need two letter of recommendations. And for those under 18, uh, you need legal documents of guardians uh, for your guardians in China. And seventh is proof of language ability. And depending on what language you're taking, uh, you need to take HSK, IELTS, TOEFL, IGCSE, and all these language exams. And here are like things to take note of when you're applying to CSC, uh, applying for CSC scholarships is that um, the university may take time to reply um, because there are so many processes they need to go through first, like they need to submit it to the embassy, then the embassy needs to give it to the university. Then there's also the process of like, if you're not accepted to your first choice of university, then um, your documents will need to go back to the embassy, which would be then to sent to your second choice. So this process takes quite a long time. Uh, so yeah, it, it, it takes really long. Um, CSC scholarships are only provided for Chinese language courses. This where it doesn't state so on the website, but based on our experience and based on what I've heard from other students is that at first they thought they could apply for English language courses, but so they didn't take HSK, right? But it turns out that um, even though you choose English language courses, they'll still, and you don't have an HSK certificate, they'll tell you to take language school and then you go to your university, which was what happened to Marsha. Right. Marsha, huh? do you want to, do you want oh. to tell about the... Okay, so uh, I wanted to apply to an English course in Beihang. So at first, the in the in the website, uh, they ask you to choose which uh, medium uh, language medium you prefer. So I chose English, and then then there's a drop down list where there's like um, choice for which university you can apply to that provides an English course. Then so I chose Beihang, but then it turns out that there is no English medium courses. So I am automatically um applied to a chinese course so i have to go through a, a year of foundation first then when i graduate from that uh, there is a task at the end of that foundation and when i graduate from that foundation then then i can go to Beihang. so that's why i started a year late um and it didn't only apply to me there's a, a lot of my classmates went through the same thing so I'm not really sure if there is an English course or not, but in the website there is, so um, you should be more careful, I guess. Or like you can just like um, ask for more information or maybe contact the university beforehand applying. Um, yeah, so next is make sure to have a HSK certificate because uh, when I chose to take uh, Chinese courses, uh, Chinese language courses, and because I didn't have a HSK certificate, I had to take a year of language school, which is also under the scholarship. But so, in, but in the end, instead of four years of schooling, I needed to take five years. Um, and next is when you apply, uh, make sure to check the validity of your passport, um, because when applying, they'll, they'll tell you to make sure that your passport is at least a year or six, a year or, a, I'm not sure actually now, but I think before it was like a year. There's before. like a, a maximum expiry date. Yeah, yeah, that thing. Uh, and 
Oh, and when I was applying, mine was already in like, I think in about five months more, it was about to expire. My passport is about to expire. So because of that, I almost was unable to apply and almost didn't get the scholarship. That's why you have to like check. Um, next is if you are under 18, you need to ensure that you have a guardian in the same city of the university of your choice. Um, I didn't about this point, I didn't really have a hard time with this because I didn't have to go through a lot of procedures. All I needed to do was just uh, send in the ID of my guardian and filled it, filled out like a, filled out this, filled out a letter that stating that like the, um, this person is my guardian, but turns out that Marsha didn't have the same experience that I did and hers was actually more hectic. So... So um, what I had to do was I had to get a guardian in the same city and then I had to go through I have to give all those documents to the embassy for the embassy to like clarify that this will be my guardian. And then I have to go to a notary office where they have to notarize all my letters. Then I had to send it to my guardian in Beijing. Then he had to bring it to a notary office in Beijing to get it all notarized. And then he sent it back to me and then it's completed. But it took a really long time because uh, at that time the embassy was not open yet. So I have to wait for the embassy to finish the process. Yeah, but I think it differs from each university and from each process. So just like, it's just something to keep in mind. Yeah, just something to keep in mind. Okay, next. Okay, next I'll be talking about why I chose China uh, to study in. First, it's because I feel like uh, it's where the business hub is. Like, uh, it has a lot of business opportunities in my opinion because um, the economy is growing and like the future, in my mind, the future is China. So uh, I wanted to be more familiarized with the Chinese language, even though we did study Chinese in the Chinese language in Bina Bangsa for like 12 years, I felt like my Chinese um, level was not that high. So I chose to study there so that I can learn more about the language. Also, um, I'm interested, uh, my major is engineering and I feel like their engineering and technology is very advanced and uh, I felt like uh, that's where I had to go and study in. Okay, thank you. Thank you, Phoebe and Marcia. Uh, now we would like to welcome Alicia to present about uh, Hong Kong application. So please share your experience. Uh, can you see the screen? Yes, Alicia, we can see. Okay, so, okay, I'll start. Uh, my name is Alicia Sutikno, and I graduated from BBS PIC in 2021. I'll be graduating, hopefully, from HKU in 2025. I'm currently doing uh, engineering, and I hope that I'll be accepted uh, to be a computer science major. Okay, so what we'll discuss today, I'll just talk about some of the Hong Kong universities and then the application process and timeline. And I'll tell you about the scholarship opportunities. And last but not least, I'll tell you like some tips. Okay, so the first one is HKU, is the first, is rank one in Hong Kong, rank four in QS Asia rankings. Uh, 2020, yeah, 22 in QS World Rankings and Rank 30 in Times Higher Education World Ranking 2022, yes. Second is HKUSD, is the second uni in Hong Kong. And this one is UHK, is the third. We have City U which is the fourth, and PolyU, the fifth. 
and then HKBU rank six. There are other like private institutions like Lingnan and like Education University of Hong Kong, but they're not as well known. So if you want to know more about that, you can uh, look it up online. So the application process and timeline. For Hong Kong, it usually, uh, application usually opens in October. It opened on the 7th of October, I think for HKU. So you can already start creating an application account and familiarize yourself with the platform. By November, the application will close and they will invite you to interviews. And in December, you will already like know whether you have conditional acceptance or not. Uh, some people will get their like acceptance in December, but I got mine in like March. So it depends. January next year, main round closes. Uh, some of the, no, most of the universities don't have a late round. So usually I recommend you to apply by January. Yeah. August, they will ask you to submit official documents like A level, uh, A level certified copy from BBS. And like if you took TOEFL and IELTS, they'll also ask you to send that, a certified copy of that. After your documents are approved, you will already have a firm offer. Also, please understand that you have to do your own research for the actual dates as they change every year. Last year, the deadline was 18 November for HKU, but I think this year is the 17th. So, yeah. Okay. Uh, most of the unis in Hong Kong require you to do like an admission interview. So somewhere around late November to early December, you may be invited to an interview. Uh, my interview for HKU, CUHK and HKUSD were group interviews. The CUHK interviewer asked us like generic interview questions like, oh, why do you want to take this major? Why CUHK? Stuff like that. Well, HKU made us like read an essay and debate on it with a few other people from different places around the world. HKUSD professors gave us a random topic that was based on their specialization and asked us to basically debate about it too. So like uh, I, my professor, like the interviewer at that time for HKUSD was an aerospace engineer. So she made us like talk about like airplanes and like flights during the pandemic. Uh, HKU, okay, I heard from one of my friends that they got like a one-on-one -on -one interview instead. So maybe it varies according to the major that you chose. So uh, some of them have individual interviews, HKUSD, CTU, PolyU, and Lingnan. I didn't get one for CTU, but in their website, it says that you will be invited to an interview. Yeah. I'm not sure about HKBU because I didn't apply. But as far as I know, HKBU requires you to do an interview if you're applying for a scholarship. So how do you apply? Unlike uh, the United Kingdom or like US, for Hong Kong unis, you have to go to the individual university websites to apply. For admission requirements, you have to check it like in their admission website. Generally, the grade requirements are AAB for most Hong Kong universities. For PolyU and HKBU, they say that it's E and above, but most people who have gotten in actually got a, B, B. So it really depends, I think, on your subject. Uh, HKUSD so far was the hardest one. You need an A star, A, B. 
Also, please understand that, uh, let's say your teacher gives you a predicted grade of AAB, and that's their admission requirement for HKU, but then that doesn't guarantee your place inside the university. You might need like two A stars or one A star, like four A stars. So it depends. So first, after checking, you obviously have to create an application account. Different universities will have different application portals. Some of them are not very convenient. It's important that you familiarize yourself with them and make sure that you don't miss anything by the deadline. And prepare supporting documents to be submitted. You may have to request some of these from the school. So first is two to three recommendation letters. One of these letters have to be a counselor recommendation letter. So like you ask your form teacher to write a recommendation letter for you. And the other two can be written by a subject teacher. HKU asked me for three, but if you submit like only two, it's fine. Some teachers may ask you to prepare like a list of achievements or hobbies in order to help them write your letters. So you also have to prepare that. My friends called it a brag sheet. So yeah. So number two, A-level predicted grades. These can be requested from Mr. Hardy and it's probably one of the most important things of your application. Since you don't have your official AS and A-level res results right now, the university will use this as a reference, like whether or not to admit you. Three is personal statements. Most universities will require a personal statement, so make sure to get that ready. Fourth, prepare scanned copies of your IGCSE and academic and non-academic transcripts. They can be requested, I think, from the school. For the fifth one, prepare scanned copies of your certificates, may it be from school or like anywhere else. Uh, this basically like serves as a proof of your achievements and activities in middle school and high school. Usually uh, the range is from if you're in Axel, Sec 2 to JC2 and for Express it's Sec 3 to JC2. For number six, uh, submit a language proficiency test. It's optional, but I recommend you to take to like submit if you have. Submit your TOEFL, SAT, GMAT, or IELTS. Yeah, it will give you an advantage if you get admitted to the university as you'll get the option to be exempted from English courses if your scores are high enough. I did my TOEFL exam around August. So if you do your test before next May, you can most likely still submit it. Also, some unis like HKU want proof of proficiency in a second language that's not English. So it may be suitable to submit like HSK transcripts if you have or IGCSE Chinese course. This is optional and you don't have to submit if you really don't have. Seven, CV or resume. Some universities require you to submit a CV or a resume and some of them usually have a page limit. So make sure to keep that in mind. Even if they don't require you to submit it in like the normal application, if you want to apply for scholarships, you probably have to submit a CV or resume. And number eight is portfolio. Portfolio is like something you have to submit if you're applying for majors like art and architecture. So if you're planning to take majors like these, make sure you have your portfolio ready. So also some of the unis have like an entrance exam. Like I think for RT check, architecture, you're, you'll be required to do a, an entrance exam of some sort when you apply for that. So what should you include in your personal statement? This essay helps the admission officers to get to know you better. Most Hong Kong unis are highly selective, so it's understandable that they only want the cream of the crop. Hundreds or even thousands of students apply to these universities each year. It's important to sell yourself, tell them why you are a good fit for their university. 
by submitting a well-written written and unique personal statement, you are sure to stand out among the other applicants. So first, talk about your character, your personality. Make sure to show and not just you know, plainly tell. For example, why would you call yourself hardworking? Give them some context. Like don't just say, oh, I'm a very hardworking student. Like you must say, well, like you must show uh, when were you actually hardworking? Just telling them that you're hardworking is not going to be enough. Number two, indicate your intended major and how your interests correlate with the major you plan to take. This shows that you're passionate in your area of interest. Why do you want this major and not any other? Third, in this part, make sure to not brag or boast about your achievements. Tell them what you had to go through. What do, your, what do you want your achievements to say about you? I recommend only including a few achievements you are most proud of and only including extracurriculars which you have leadership positions. If not, then including anything is fine. And lastly, include why you want to go to Hong Kong and why you want to go to like HKU or HKUSD. Be it internship opportunities, extracurricular activities, job prospects, or even the environment, tell the admission officers why you want to go to their university. Every university is unique and it's your responsibility to find out what makes each of them so special and so different from one another. Oh, I made a typo. Personal statement, what not to do. Okay, don't, don't lie. Admission officers usually know when students are lying. They've read more personal statements than you could ever think of. Second, don't brag. I mean, it's natural that we dislike people who tend to brag. It's better to stay humble. Third, don't plagiarize. Like, don't look up online HKU personal statement or something. They can check it. So yeah, don't plagiarize. Don't copy your friend's personal statement and don't reuse a personal statement you have written before if you're planning to do a gap year. And lastly, recheck your spelling and grammar. This shows that you care. But still, the best advice I can give you is to just be yourself. Write in the style you are most comfortable with. Talk about the things you like the things you're passionate about and why do you want to learn more about that in university. So again, just be yourself and I cannot stress this enough. Writing my personal statement was probably the most time consuming part of my application. I had to go through like so many drafts, scrap so many ideas. So I hope that you've already started writing yours. Advanced standing. Some universities like CUHK and CTU will allow you to apply for advanced standing upon submission of your normal application. But for HKU and HKUST, you apply for advanced standing once after you get admitted, like after you get the firm offer. I didn't apply for this, but one of my friends did. Advanced standing, basically, uh, you have to do 240 credits in HKU to graduate. But if you have advanced standing, yeah, you get to do less. Like they cut some of the courses. For CUHK, you apply during the application period. They will look at your grades and see if you qualify. Yeah, so you will finish school in three years instead of the normal four. For CTU, you also apply during the application period from the application portal. I don't recommend this because none of my friends and I got accepted for advanced standing programs in CTU. I think A-level scores are not sufficient to apply for advanced standing in CTU. You have to have like, I don't know what the name is in English, but you have to like have a Detiga degree, like a two-year schooling that's not high school. Yeah. At the end of the day, it's up to you. I can't decide if it's better to apply for advanced standing or not because it depends on the person. Some people finish, want to finish school early while some still want to focus on their education before going out into like the real world. 
One of the disadvantages of this, I would say, is that you probably will miss out on some important information that your friends are learning. Uh, okay. Just a heads up, every part of your application is important, but personally, I'd have to admit that your grades are probably the most important things. So make sure you study well and get those A stars because I've seen friends with bad interviews still get accepted to the best HK unis because their predicted grades were like four A stars. I've seen friends who have never done any extracurricular work but still get admitted because of their four A stars. But then again, even if your grades aren't the highest, you still stand a chance by impressing the interviewers or improving your non-academic portfolio. Now scholarship opportunities. Types of scholarships, university admission scholarship, Hong Kong government belt and road scholarship, and three other scholarships. Uh, university admission scholarship. How to apply? You don't have to apply, just submit your application, they will consider you immediately. What are the requirements? Uh, get good grades in your A-levels, yes. How much is this worth? It depends on your grades. So the higher, yeah, the better. Just a heads up, also some universities don't consider language subjects like Chinese, English for the scholarship. So what does this mean? For HKU, let's say, even if you get A star for Chinese or A in English language, I mean A star, English language or EGP, they won't consider that as an A star or A. So let's say you have five A stars, maths, chem, physics, bio, and Chinese. They'll exclude your Chinese, so you only have four A stars. You won't get the like highest scholarship. So this is a comparison of different universities, university admission scholarship, HKU, five A stars and OCLA full tuition accommodation allowance and living allowance. So like they pay you to go to school there. Yeah. OCLA is outstanding Cambridge learner award that like uh, best in Indonesia for biology, best in the world for math, something like that. So the lowest in HKU, three A star, one A is half tuition. HKUSD, 5A star, renewable, 4A star, one off, full tuition, 3A star, one off, half tuition. One off scholarships, meaning they only give you in your first year. It's not renewable. So second year onwards, you don't have a scholarship anymore. CUHK, 4A star, full tuition, plus allowance from the faculty. 3A star, 1A, three-fourths tuition. And some of the students may receive an allowance from the university. So you have a full scholarship at the end. I'm not sure how many A stars you need for a half scholarship at CUHK. Also, the this uh, allowance from the from the CUHK like gotten to you, but so yeah, just think of it as a three fourths tuition scholarship. Said to you, for A star full tuition and allowance of. HKD 40K. So yeah, if you get four A stars, it you pay you to go to school there. Three A stars full tuition, two A star and an A is half tuition. Poly U, three A star full tuition plus allowance, three A only full tuition or half tuition. For Poly U, even like let's say you get four A star, but then your initial scholarship, uh, they only say, oh, half tuition. You cannot upgrade it. So yeah. This means that just because you get four A stars doesn't mean you will have full tuition plus allowance. They, according to my friend who goes there, he says that the scholarship is awarded like depending on your admission interview and scholarship essay, as these are the larger determining factors. Uh, PolyU doesn't require you to submit a personal statement, it's just a scholarship essay. Like, why do you want a scholarship? For HKBU, only one of my friends applied and he said that you needed 
three A's for a scholarship, but they didn't tell me how much it was worth. HKSAR Belt and Road Scholarship, how to apply. Most universities don't need you to apply for this one and the university will personally like nominate students based on who they want nominated. But for HKU, you have to apply. What are the requirements? Uh, have a good non-academic track record and a good academic track record. Your grades should not differ much from predicted grades. Let's say you have four A star. Yeah, don't get to A star. You might not get the scholarship. Oh, but uh, the good thing about this one is that let's say your predicted grades are three A star, one B. So you will still be able to get a full scholarship even though you don't have four A stars. How much is this worth? In my year, it was only full tuition, but uh, last year, students got accommodation allowance as well. For HKU, you need to submit a scholarship essay upon submission of your application, and a month later, they will ask you to submit your CV and write another essay. You might be called for an interview, uh, but I didn't, did, I didn't do the interview. They didn't ask me to. A fellow BBS alumni got called for an interview, but I did not. But just because you didn't get an interview doesn't mean that you won't get the scholarship. You, you, you can just wait. So the further details of the HKU essays, the first essay, the one you have to submit like with your application is a one page write up explaining why you should be considered for a scholarship and what your plans are after graduation. And the second essay, the one after your application, is four paragraphs about my academic achievements, contribution to institution or society, leadership experiences, and communication abilities. And lastly, interest in integrating to con or contributing to Hong Kong society. The thing is with the scholarship, only 10 Indonesian students are selected for this per year. So write your essays well and impress the interviewers with your interview. Do your best in your exams and make sure to participate in non-academic activities as this one is very competitive compared to the uh, normal scholarship. In 2021, four out of 10 recipients were from BBS Pick, so don't lose hope. And in previous years, as far as I know, at least one of these 10 people would be from BBS pick. So yeah. Oh, also, uh, I think if, if you feel like your grades aren't like the best, but you still want the scholarship, there's no harm in applying for this one. Cause one of my friends didn't have a four A stars for their predicted grades, but they got the scholarship. So in Uh, I think we lost Alicia. Okay. Uh, while we are waiting for Alicia to return, maybe she has a connection problem. So I uh, would like to ask, uh, or maybe before I ask a question, I would like to... Uh, remind everyone how to ask the question is by first you click the reaction button yeah and then there is a raise hand button there then you can uh, click that raise hand button and then later you can turn on your camera and your microphone and then ask the question so uh, wait until i call your name then you can uh, turn on microphone and also camera and then ask your question Okay, while we are waiting for Alicia to return to the Zoom room, I would like to ask a question uh, for Marcia and PB. Uh, I think based on what you have presented, 
uh, you said that uh, you have to apply to a certain website for the for the CSC scholarship, right? And then uh, you also explain about you have to apply to the university website. And then you mentioned also that only certain sub certain major uh, and certain university is in that uh, scholarship list right so how 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 do you combine the, this uh application outside the between the csc and also your uh, university application uh so basically when we apply to csc there's actually like um three different routes you can take uh i'm not actually sure because before when we were applying to CSC it was uh, uh, Zhang Hui Lao Shi and Lao Shi Jennifer who helped us through the entire process so if you guys aren't sure maybe you can ask uh, Lao Shi Jennifer but basically the process um, the route we were in was that uh, the CSC would be the one applying for our universities uh, so so um, like when you apply to the, uh, you don't actually need to apply to the university yourself because CSC will already do it for you under the scholarship. But there's also the chance where like, if you don't get the scholarship, then you won't get into any uni because when you apply to CSC, that's solely for CSC scholarship. And when you apply to CSC scholarship, they, they let you choose two options, two, two different universities. And so, like, the likelihood of not getting the scholarship is not that, um, uh, the likelihood of not getting the scholarship is not that high, not that, You probably yeah. the scholarship. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, it's, yeah, probably get, because there's, like, two different options, because, yeah, there's two different choices. But what you can also do, which was what Marsha did, she actually applied for CSC and she also applied to Peihang uh, using the non-scholarship route. Well, I applied to, um, because I wasn't sure if I was gonna get it because uh, it's a full scholarship, right? Then in my mind, um, it's very hard to get. So I applied to, um, I think five other universities by myself. Um, I researched my own. Um, and also I, because uh, more flexibility, if you don't find what you want to study in the CSC scholarship uh, list, you should probably um, apply. And by uh, anyways, um, schools in China is really not that expensive. The living allowance, the accommodation is very, is very affordable. Also the tuition fee, unless uh, for government school is very affordable also, unless you're going to like XJTLU, Nottingham, and NYU Shanghai. NYU Shanghai, they are very, very, like, it's like four times, I think, more expensive than government, school, uh, government schools. But uh, like, keep in mind that government schools are usually about like in rupiah, when you convert it to rupiah, it was, it's like, around 60 to 80 mil per semester. Whereas like those- Not uh, that, uh, there's like some 20 only. Jadi kayak range nya 20 to 30 RMB, which is 40 to 60 mil. Yeah. Kalau um, XGTLU, last time I also applied to XGTLU, it was 88 RMB per year or per semester. So it's uh, four times the price. 160 mil. Yeah, 160 million. That's only the tuition fee. Not yet. Also, the accommodation usually for uh, private universities are also more expensive, even though it's uh, still in the same city. Uh, their dormitories usually more expensive. However, it is true that uh, government dormitories are a bit uh, lower in standard. No, but but I think international students international students have their own dorm. But still, uh, compared to like uh, NYU, Shanghai, or uh, XJTLU, uh, yeah, makes sense. Like, that's why they're more expensive. But it's not bad. It's just like lower in standard. Like you can also check out YouTube if like you're unsure about the accommodation and stuff. They, there usually are like YouTube videos on the different accommodations. Or check out the CUCAS website. Usually it's complete there. They have uh, pictures and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. 
Okay, so uh, actually you can apply to CSC and then uh, uh, maybe as a backup apply to the uh, the other university. Yeah. yeah. Uh, and then if you if you want to apply for CSC, do you do you have to apply again uh, to that university website or it's automatically uh, you oh. are uh, there? No, no, no. It's system. automatically you go to the university because CSC will be the one applying for you. Oh, I see. Okay. Okay. Two in one. So once you apply for CSC, they will apply to the university for you. You don't have to do anything. Just apply for the CSC. Oh, okay. 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 Welcome back, Alicia. <laughs> Sorry. Yeah, no problem. Uh, please continue uh, your presentation. Where were we? <laughs> uh, disabled, sir. Oh, oh sorry. Uh, need to become co-host. Uh, Mr. Richard? Mr. Richard, hello. Can you make Alicia co-host? Yep. Please, Alicia. Can you can you see the screen? You can see it. Okay. So have other scholarships, but if you have an Indonesian passport and are of Indonesian nationality, I don't recommend applying for other scholarships as the chances of you getting it are very low. So just stick to the entrance scholarship or the Belt and Road scholarship. Can Belt and Road, you don't have to get for A stars. So yeah, just apply. What are the requirements? It depends. How much is this worth? It also depends. But as far as I know, it's not full tuition. For more information, you can check, like, oops, you can check in the HKU fees and scholarship section. Have in their uh, admission website. How to apply? You have to submit like another application if you want to be considered. One of my friends applied for a sports scholarship and didn't get accepted. So, yeah, don't. If you know that you're not like that good and you have only participated in like school sports events and like not at the national like level or you know international level don't bother applying for this one after receiving a scholarship or scholarship offer what do you do maintain good grades for you hk and hkst you have to maintain a gpa of 3.0 in order to keep your renewable scholarship. In HKU, GPA has to be 3.2. It depends on your scholarship too, yeah. For my scholarship, the Belt and Road one, if you fail to get a G CGPA, cumulative GPA of 3.2, the scholarship basically been cabut. You, you won't get it anymore. But for the normal entrance scholarship, let's say I get like only 2.9, they will not completely like cut my scholarship but they will only reduce it so let's say right now i have full tuition and i get gpa only 2.2.9 they give me half tuition so yeah i still have something for cuhk the university will ask you to write another essay and that essay looks something like a combination of hku's personal statement and the belt and road essay i mentioned just now for HKU, you, the university expects you to write a thank you letter to the donor every year and include pictures of your experience at the uni in the past year. So even like, I this is my first year in HKU, but I still had to write a thank you letter. So like you talk about like, oh, how did the scholarship help you and stuff like that. So what if I don't get a scholarship? It's fine because you can always apply for a scholarship even after admission into the university. But this means that you would need to keep up a high CGPA or GPA. So you don't get the scholarship, the entrance scholarship or the Belt and Road scholarship. It's fine because usually uh, they will email you like 
about scholarship opportunities and there are a lot. So as long as you have a high GPA, I'm sure you can be considered. And lastly, tips and advice during my application. One, should I apply in main round or early round? Hong Kong universities will start offering you places as early like as, early as December to February. So unlike uni UK universities, they all have different deadlines for the initial down payment. In UK, it's a standardized date. So like by this, you must choose whether you want to go to University of Edinburgh or Manchester and you just pay for the uni you want to go to. But for HK, it's not like that. So like maybe I got I got my offer for CUHK in December. Yeah, I must pay by January. Then HKU I will get at March. I must pay by May or something like that. So unless you are willing to spend like tons of money on these down payments, apply to Hong Kong unis in the main round if they are like only your backups. If not, then feel free to apply in the early rounds. Two. Understand that which round you apply in affects chances of a scholarship. If you apply in the main round, your chances of getting a scholarship are like decreased, very low. If you apply in the late round, you might not get accepted despite having achieved like four A stars or like amazing grades basically. For three over here, uh, understand that the rankings don't determine the quality and difficulty of the university. It depends on your major. Like, uh, look at HKBU and PolyU. Just because they're ranked quite low doesn't mean that they are bad. PolyU and HKBU offer many majors that HKU, CUHK, HKUST don't. Unlike the other universities, HKBU is actually a liberal arts university. So as for the difficulty, my engineering friends in CUHK and PolyU are learning the same thing, despite both universities have different, having different rankings. And for engineering, like in terms of HKU and HKUST, my friend in HKUST is having like a blast. He doesn't have to do anything. He's so free, okay? Meanwhile, here I am suffering. But it depends. Four, world rankings, individual subject rankings and employability rankings. Besides the world rankings, I recommend you to check individual subject rankings and employability rankings as well. Despite ranking lower than HKU, CUHK uh, is actually... I think your screen might be frozen. Yes. Or so I think you're... Oh, oh my God. Okay, okay. now, now sure. it's, it's on. Yeah, thank you. <laughs> okay, yeah, there. One, two, three. Uh, like just now I mentioned. Four, the world, the rankings in websites, you see like US ranking, the Times Higher Education ranking. So you also have to check QS employability ranking as well and subject ranking. Despite uh, CUHK ranking lower than HKU, CUHK is actually the best university in Hong Kong for computer science. So yeah. Five, choose the university you like. If you don't like it, you won't have fun. There's no point. Research the communities, find out about the professors, how, how do they teach? Ask your seniors for their experiences in the university, find out what companies the alumni end up in and like ask yourself, would you wanna work there? There's nothing more, there's nothing better than finding out more. Six, location and living costs. Uh, yeah, this is important because HKU is located near Central, like the place it's called Central, it's located near Central. So everything like snacks, food, apartment, like they're very expensive compared to the rest of Hong Kong. So let's say you pay $5 for a bag of chips in CUHK and HKU it's $10. So yeah. Also like if you want to go to HKUST, do you want to live near the ocean? Do you want to travel two hours just to go to the city? You have to consider that, yeah. Like, I don't want, so I didn't choose HKUSD. CUHK. You have to run to your classes, but then in order to get to your classes, you have to ride a bus. What if the bus late? You late to your class. 
and CUHK filled with hills. So you need to have strong leg muscles here. Yeah. If you want to know about uh, CUHK, you can ask Kevin Tanjaya, DM him. He's in this meeting, I think. Oh, okay. Uh, wait, I'll tell you why I chose HKU because like, according to my like explanation, it seemed like I didn't like, like it's more likely that people choose other unis instead of HKU. But like, why did I go for HKU? Because like, uh, it completely depends on the person. It depends on you. Because ever since P6, I've always wanted to go to HKU because I've seen like my friends, sisters getting accepted and receiving scholarships there. And like, it made me like, wow, HKU. So no matter how, how, how much you tell me, you know, yeah, UCLA better or like UCB better, Edinburgh better, Imperial better. Why you turn down the offer? Well, because I want to go to HKU. So yeah. Okay, Q and A. After that, then thank you. Okay, thank you, Alicia. So basically, why you choose HKU? It's because of your uh, childhood dream, something like that. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Now, uh, if you have any questions, uh, you are uh, participants. Yeah, you are welcome to click the reaction button and then raise your hand. And then I will call your name and please turn on your camera and microphone so we can uh, allow you to speak. Now, uh, Josh, uh, please turn on the camera and your microphone. Wait, I've turned my camera, sir. <laughs> Yola. Okay, give me a second, sir. Give me a second. <laughs> I have to do the want to uh, look at a blank screen, no face. Uh, I wanted to add something. Oh, uh, yes. You sure. forgot to mention that the Chinese universities really like that me and Phoebe are a part of the bicultural program. Uh, during, I did to I did have to go through an interview when I applied to Peihang on the normal route, not the CSC route. Uh, they also asked a lot a lot of questions about it. Uh, Phoebe also got the same response. So. If you are not a part of the bicultural, I suggest that you be a part of it because um, it they really like that you are involved in the Chinese culture and everything like that. Oh, thank you for the suggestion. And uh, the, the program looks uh, interesting and useful yeah, for your university application. Okay, so, uh, oh yeah, I would like to inform participants that uh, we are going to extend this uh, session until 3.30. Yeah, please, uh, Josh, what is your question? Uh, Alicia, so like when you um, submitted your personal statement, did you submit it with your, when you applied or did they ask it for you as submitting documents? Uh, wait, for HKU, like you submit, an application right through the NGS application system and then after mm -hmm. that after you fill in like counselor information your personal information and stuff they will uh, give you access to this section called supporting document submission so at that time you already have to have your personal statement ready and then you submit through there you upload the pdf but would it be okay if you like so um so for hku the deadline is about like mid-november right yeah. Um, would it be somewhat possible if we gave our spring documents after the deadline or or like everything? So like academic transcript plus like supporting documents, do you have to submit it before November, mid-November? Uh, as far as I remember for the application, for the submitting document section, different documents have different dates. Okay. So like, yeah, you have to look at that. Okay, anyone has another question? You are welcome to raise your hand. Yeah, while we are waiting for someone to ask question uh, for Alicia, uh, for the condition of the scholarship uh, the, about the A star and A, is that 
the the condition of the predicted grades or the actual uh, Cambridge uh, result? I think everyone. Okay, so when you submit your application, everyone gets an initial scholarship offer. So like, they will tell you like, oh, this for HKU, yeah, Poly U and like other unis probably different. But for HKU, they will like give you a document and they tell you, oh, if you want scholarship, you need to get this amount of A stars. So like, let's say you're predicted great for A star, but then at the end, you end up only getting two A star. Yeah, you won't get a scholarship. So yeah. Okay, so uh, how about uh, Phoebe and Marcia? When, when you apply for the university, do they give you any condition for your application? There's no condition, uh, but probably they will look at it because uh, when you apply, the embassy is not the one that uh, will be accepting your offer, it's the university itself. But then in the website, there's no like, you have to at least get this or this because uh, uh, I think in Hong Kong, it's more like uh, everybody can apply with A-levels. But then in China, there's a lot of, um, they accept a lot, like they accept SAT, uh, A-levels, IB. So there's no really like uh, in the website, don't have um, requirements, like have to at least get this, just apply. Then later, if you're the university, like your application like that, they'll probably accept you when just remember like when even when you apply to CSC you just make sure to check your university website to see what their requirements are for each major and for each course okay uh, is that mean that when you are accepted in a chinese university that means it is an unconditional offer yeah once they accept it's unconditional already Mm. But uh, and, from I what I heard from my um kakak kelas my uh itu they see uh, those yang also got uh CSE scholarship they say if you cannot maintain like you at least have to only pass you don't have to like maintain a very high GPA you just have to pass each year then you can get you can still keep your scholarship if not then uh I think they say they also don't know they're not sure but then i think like for example you fail only like like the passing uh, percentage in china is 60 percent if you only get 50 percent like that uh you'll be paid like you have to pay like a small amount but then if you uh if fail like lower you'll pay this amount like like you have to reimburse they say wow. but i'm not sure they're, they're also not sure because they have not yet met anyone that have failed yet <laughs> Okay, that is interesting. Yeah? Okay, and then uh, about uh, after receiving the scholarship, do you have any contract that you have to work in China or maybe in Hong Kong? Uh, no, there there's no there's no contract. Actually, um, international students are actually not allowed to work in China. Like mm -hmm. you so... are not until uh in your fourth year like yeah. when you're about to graduate then you are legally allowed if like even if you want a part-time in like uh, your third year you're not technically allowed but a lot of my uh seniors told me like if you're in your fourth year you have to like it's better for you to get a job like then go home to your uh to indo because like the 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 experience you'll get there is like very different, like their work, work ethic and everything else. And also, like, even though you're just a part timer, they say your allowance is like really like very big. They really like like international students, maybe because like, you know, like a lot of language, like they really cherish you, even though you're just a part timer there. Yeah. How about Alicia? Because uh, in, I think in your presentation, you have to mention about uh, how you're going to contribute to Hong Kong community, right? Oh, uh, okay, Hong Kong visa, but okay. It doesn't normally, uh, it doesn't allow you to work like part-time like in cafe or something like that. Like you have to request for approval from your university. Like, can I, you have to ask them like, can I work part-time? And they will have the choice to like say no. So yeah, 
But internship for HKU in the third year, you will get paid. It's a few months. So it's lumayan, I guess. And in the fourth year, uh, usually your job is like your internship. The internship you get, let's say, in JP Morgan. Yeah, your official job also in JP Morgan. So it's something like that. Okay. Do, do you have to uh, do the job in Hong Kong or you can uh, do the job outside Hong Kong? Oh, uh, my kakak kelas, Marco Brian Wijaya, that, uh, that he, I think, I don't know if he graduated already or if, it, or if he's in his fourth year, but then he said he internship at like Shopee or something like that. Then after that, he got a job at Shopee, but then the Shopee in Singapore. Mm -hmm. So like, doesn't mean that you graduate from Hong Kong, you work in Hong Kong, you can work in like mm -hmm. other countries. Okay, Just but, apply. Uh, but there is no contract yeah, to, to work in Hong Kong or Hong Kong uh, companies, something like that, yeah? No, don't have. But I think if you get Belt and Road Scholarship, my, uh, like, if Indonesia, like, you build press, you know, you have to urusin. What, what can you repeat? What what is that? if Indonesia lagi like, pil press, you know, pilih presiden, okay, presiden okay. election. Uh -huh. You have to urusin the like bantu urusin like the votes and stuff like that for people in Hong Kong. Oh, <laughs> okay, okay. <laughs> that means in uh twenty twenty four. Yeah. Okay, Josh. Please uh, turn on your microphone and camera. Uh, so just now you mentioned about HKUST, I'm sorry, HKU and HKUST, like, and HKU being more busy. Could you, like, clarify on what you mean by that? And, like, to what extent? Wait, that's honestly, like, my fault, see. I didn't apply for advanced standing. But then my friend, Kenard, he applied for advanced standing. So he have less courses, though, obviously. So, yeah, he has less workload than me. But had I, like, accept, like, applied for advanced standing, I probably would have less workload now. But if you normal student without advanced standing, both universities, it should be um, the same, yeah, like same amount of workload. But it also like, kan in university, it's not like BBS, they, they ask you, oh, chemistry, 7 a.m., physics, 10 a.m. You get to choose what you want to study and when you want to study. So let's say this semester, I don't want to study physics. It would just next semester. And each semester, there's a maximum uh, amount of credits you can take. And it is also partially my fault that I took the full amount of credits, right? Harusnya, yeah, like normal people just take five courses. But no, I decided to take like six, okay? Instead of normal 10 per year, I, I have 12 now. Why am I subjecting myself to such suffering? Because uh, in your first year and second year, my kaka class said like, oh, it's only repeating A levels, AS levels. It's not going to be that hard. Just take the maximum amount, of course. So later when you're year three, year four, you will be more relaxed and you will have like, because you have more important things to think about by year three and year four. Year three, you have to find internship. You have to apply. You have to, you know, like, do interviews and stuff. You have to improve your portfolio. Year four, you already have to find a job. So it's better to suffer now than you later. Yes. Thank you. Josh, do you have any other question because you are still raising your hand? I completely forgot my next question, so I'm just gonna think <laughs> about it first. <laughs> Okay, my uh, my last question is about regarding the pandemic. Yeah, uh, how how do you study in your university, and then is there any difficulty entering the country? Uh, uh, yeah, can you explain more about it uh, for all speakers? Uh, for China, because China right now is. Um, China is not accepting international students right now, so they, but they actually already started offline school. So it's like it's in this like weird situation where like half of the students are offline, half of the students are online. 
And depending on how many international students are per major, um, so like my course, there's only three international students, right? So what they do is they just film the class. Like it's like a live broadcast of the class and we just follow it. But for majors that have a lot of international students, they have uh, live classes through VOOF meeting or Zoom meeting, depending on the university. If my university, um, my university, the classes, there's a lot of international students from a lot of different majors, not only like specific majors. So the first year and the second year, all the international students taking in Chinese courses are combined. So like we all have general classes. So Alicia said she can choose her courses. Me and Phoebe, we got like timetable like BBS like that. <laughs> so we still have to like uh, follow follow those classes. So it's still like very general. Uh, sorry, was I lagging? Yes, no, yes, a while. Oh, okay. So like, yeah, um, we had to follow just the timetable. So it's bad for people that are living up in the other side of the globe because their time zone is very different. But then lucky for us, uh, China is just one hour earlier. So uh, it's not that bad, but we have 12 courses per semester, per year, eh, per semester, have it. Semester, per semester, but so we pack the schedule. It's pretty packed, but I think later on it'll be less packed because uh, for like my university is apparently our first semester is they chose for us just for uh, just for convenience since we're still in our first semester uh, but starting second semester we get to choose our courses what courses we'll take for the year and everything and also like there's a lot of like um courses young like so yeah, nothing to do with our major it's just like the, the university want us to take so, like for my my school specializes in aerospace, right? So all the students, even like business major, uh, art major students, they have to take a course, like general study about aviation technology like that. And then we have like Chinese culture classes, idiom sayings classes like that. Oh, but I think for the aviation thing, it depends on each university because I don't have that. It just depends. So like just do your research on the university. Yeah, okay. How about uh, Hong Kong, Alicia? Uh, I do, okay. I think my experience will not apply to you guys anymore because by the, like, by the time you guys already, like, been accepted to the Hong Kong University, you probably already have to go there in real life. But right now, they give, like, they record live classes. Then after that, they, like, stream it on Zoom and we get to watch. And after that, the recording, they upload it also onto the learning uh, management system. So you can just refer to it, like if you have any doubts with the lesson. So, yeah. Okay, uh, Josh, uh, wait for your question. Uh, I'm going to give you after the closing, yeah? Please stay back, Josh. <laughs> okay, I have to end this meeting since we are already uh, 3.33. Yeah, thank you very much, participant, for coming to this Hong Kong and mainland China application sharing, sharing session. I would like also to thank Phoebe, Marcia, and Alicia for sharing your experience, your tips, and suggestions. Uh, so our, our student in BBS, whether in PIC or other campus, or maybe in other school attending this uh, session, or maybe watching from YouTube, can have a better chance to applying to Hong Kong and China. Thank you very much, everyone. If you still have any question, you may uh, stay back and uh, maybe uh, the speaker can uh, wait for a few minutes uh, to answer the personal questions. Okay, thank you, everyone. You may leave the meeting room. Bye-bye. Uh, pa Parichat? you can turn off the YouTube streaming and then uh,